today's reading is taken from Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. You therefore have no excuse. You will pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment in the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a man human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, for theirs and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you in hands? But because of your stubbornness, and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, He will give eternal life. And for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be one and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law. They are the law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the consciences also bear witness, and their thoughts sometimes killing them and at other times he will defend them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can have your Bibles out and um, turn to chapter 2 of Romans. I'm sure it will help you. Um, well, we are um, in the series of going through Romans. Uh, it's a typical passage that talks about God's wrath being poured out again and God's judgment, impending judgment. Uh, it's not a message that I particularly want to preach, but this is, uh, this is God's word given to us, and so we must hear it humbly. But let's pray that the Spirit will give us ears to hear. Lord, we thank you that all of your word is God breathed, it's inspired, and it speaks to us. And we pray now that by the power of your Spirit, Prepare our hearts to be soils that will receive your word with great joy. Uh, the kind of hearts that will uh, take where your words will take deep root uh, so they might bear fruit for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. How do people answer the question, are you a good person? Are you a good person? So people might say, well, I haven't killed anyone, I haven't cheated on my wife. Um, and I try to tell the truth, I give to charity, generally, yeah, I think so. But then, if you ever got, I mean, when was the last time you got mad at somebody? It's not for those big things, right? It's for these little things. You know, we might say something like, it's not, what, it's not what you said, it's the way that you spoke to me. Or you might be driving, you might go, how oh, can this person turn left without signaling left? We get indignant about small things. And that is the tendency for all of us, isn't it? We have these high standards, impossibly high standards for other people. But when it comes to us, our tendency is to lower the standards. And that's why it's so easy to judge others with these low standards. After a chapter of God telling us, and that God is, uh, Paul telling us that God is revealing his wrath towards the world, uh, Paul then uh, comes down and focuses on moral writers. People who think, well, that's actually for other people. It's not really for me. I'm doing pretty well, while these other people are doing terribly. He addresses the moral writers who feel pretty good about themselves. 
So it tells them here that they're not the judge, that they too will be judged, surprisingly, by their words, by the fair standards that have been revealed to them. So verse 1 says, you who pass on judgment on someone else. Of course, this can't mean, possibly mean that we can't judge anyone, that we should suspend all judgment, we should check our minds out, and we should just turn our blind eyes when our brothers and sisters sin. No, that's not what it means. After all, Paul often points out when people do wrong things. I mean, he just has given us a long list of things that people do wrong in. And we are to pursue holiness together. This is Luke chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus tells us, if your brother or, sin, or sister sin against you, uh, rebuke them. And if they repent, then forgive them. Paul charges Timothy and Titus to gently rebuke people who sin in the church. Jesus tells the church how to conduct church discipline in Matthew 18, how to gently speak to the people who are sitting in the church and what the procedure should be in order to, uh, to, to the point that, that we can kick somebody out of the church. Now this is not to suspend all our thinking or judgment, renounce all correcting and exhorting, but what then does it mean? Well, first of all, it's wrong, I think, saying to uh, to watch out for hypocrisy verse one where he says for whatever uh, for whatever point you judge another you are condemning yourself because you pass on judgment uh, you who pass on judgment do the same thing there is a level of hypocrisy in all our judgments isn't there I see it myself I've had to counsel as my position as a pastor for tell people not to be proud, or tell people not to be greedy, or lustful, or um, uh, to uh, be disobedient to parents, or slander, gossip, all those things. But I, I do it knowing that I do these things myself. That there is a level of hypocrisy that I cannot escape. I am a sinner telling another person. That's all of us. We're all sinners, aren't we? Actually, I think this is one of the reasons why people sometimes are so harsh on other people because they wake up and they look at themselves in the mirror and they don't like the person they see themselves on the mirror because they know that they have sinned. And sometimes when people know that they're sinners, how they react is by cutting other people down to make themselves feel better. I'm so sorry. Some, some, can we just turn that up? I found it a little too distracting. Yeah, it's too loud. Sorry. Philosopher Thomas Hobbes wrote that some people can keep themselves in their own favor by observing the imperfections of other men. So they cut other people down. So the proper response to recognizing our moral impurity is repentance and to stop acting like that we're in the place of God, a place of judgment towards other people. We're not God's. And that's what he says in verses 2 and 3. He says, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on the truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass on judgment um, on them and get to the same thing, you will escape God's judgment. We are to recognize that we're just human beings, that God is the ultimate judge, that only God can judge based on the truth. Only God can judge based on uh, purity, pure moral perfection. Only God should judge us from the placement of judgment. Well, the moralizers might still say, well, I'm still better than these other people, and how can I just turn a blind eye when people do bad things? Uh, God seems also happy with me. I'm blessed. God seems not angry with me. I'm blessed. My, my life is pretty good. My career is going pretty well. I'm pretty happy. But friends, that God blesses us is not a sign of our personal righteousness. It's a sign of God's grace. It's a sign of God's grace. I wake up each day and I count my blessings. I am really thankful for Mary, for my kids, for all of you, for the, for the and I can do the work that I am doing, get paid for it. And I, I count my blessings, but I know that as I count my blessings, that I'm not blessed because I'm I am blessed because I know my heart. I know, I know my heart. I know what goes on. I know that this is a sign. These blessings that God has given me are a sign of God's kindness and 
God's love and mercy and not a sign of my righteousness. It's a sign that God is rich in kindness, forbearing, and He's merciful. And that's certainly true of all those people, all the people who also reject Jesus and still are following their evil desires. They aren't innocent either, are they? It's just that our Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our enemies. Psalm 103, verse 1. You see, God, in His kindness, does not give us what we deserve. That's sign of God's kindness. But that day will come when everyone will get what they deserve. But the reason why it's time now is because he wants more people to come to faith, come to know Jesus, to be saved. Friends, how entitled do you feel in life? Moralizers, people who look down on others, people who think they're better than others, often feel superior to others and they feel entitled to a good life. And when bad things happen, they can't understand because they have put God in their debt by doing good things. And they feel angry at what God has done. No, but it's the other way around, as we'll see shortly. If we are indeed judged fairly, uh, we'll know that we deserve this condemnation, that we are blessed far beyond uh, what we should be, and that every gift is a blessing from the Lord and a sign of His kindness and patience towards us, and they are meant for us to, that they are meant and to lead us to repentance. Jesus told us to store up treasures in heaven. And verse 5 actually then tells us you can do exactly the opposite as well. To store up God's wrath against us. The picture is here of a dam. That's uh, the swelling, uh, growing bigger and bigger, that will eventually burst open. And that day is the God of the day of the judgment. God who is kind, kind, abounding in love, is also the judge over the world. He cannot just forgive. He cannot simply turn a blind eye. He needs to make things right. He would not respect the God who just says, I'll forgive everybody. It, it, even though you have ruined the world, you have done evil things. No. But what's surprising in this passage is not that God will judge. I think you understand that it's a good thing that God judges that He does not let evil things go. But I think what's surprising in verse 6 that we'll be judged according to what we have done, according to our works. Verses 7 to 8, those who persist uh, will do good. In their eternal life, and those who do bad things, follow evil ways, will uh, be given over to God's righteous wrath. You might ask if you're a good Protestant person like me, does this mean that some of us we would be given eternal life based on our works and not our faith? Not exactly. Paul here is not leaving a room for salvation by works here. If you glance down to verse 12, he goes to say, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. All who sin uh, under the law will also be judged by the law. You see, they will perish and they'll be judged. The context here, here is not one of salvation, it's one of judgment. In fact, this is how Paul concludes this whole section, chapters 1 through 3. The section ends in chapter 3, verse 10. All, there's no one who is righteous, not even one. Or famously, chapter 3, verse 23, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all fall short of God's glory. We, we are all sinners. And when our works are laid out, apart from the faith that in Jesus, while our works are laid out, our works will condemn us and not save us. And how can you say, though, that those who do good things will eternal, uh, inherit eternal life. But those who have faith in Jesus will demonstrate that faith by their works, won't they? You see, faith and work have always gone together. Paul doesn't separate his 
James has been separated, one trust in Jesus, that genuine faith will bear the works of, uh, of faith. Works, uh, genuine faith will inherently produce works of faith. So on the judgment day, God will not ask you, do you believe in Jesus? What God will do is God will lay out the works and say, yes, your work show that you have faith in Jesus. And your works here do not show the faith in Jesus. Because it's a public demonstration at the end of the day. And apart from the faith in Jesus, our works will only condemn us. And I know that this is hard to hear. But even the best of our friends, who are kind and understanding, apart from faith in Jesus, will receive condemnation. And you might think this is hard. But just take a look at the state of the world from God's perspective. All our little sins, all the things that we think are little, our pride, our lust, envy, lies, greed, lack of mercy towards others. Um, these are little to you, but they add up to ruin God's good world, haven't they? And our sins don't just affect us, it affects other people. It creates this world that is fallen. Our pride might uh, create an oppressive work environment. You know, uh, uh, it affects us in all sorts of ways. Our greed might further create this world, uh, further uh, create, uh, further exploit the poor. Our lives, small and big ways, create this environment where we can't trust each other. We have to be behind people's words. Our boss supports billion dollar industry of porn and whatever. Our little seeds of sins add up and they become colonialism, racism, slavery, genocide, exploitation. In all these ways, our little sins add up to these big sins that have grave consequences. And I know that the difference between a murderer and me is actually not a different kind of sin, but sin that is different in degree, not in time. There is anger in me that could be nurtured into murder given the right circumstances. But it is in there, in me as well as somebody who murders another human being. All this is to say, our sins are not little. It's hard, but it's, it is important to hear. It's hard, it's, it's important because it's important to get the right diagnosis. If I have a chest pain, uh, chest pain um, in my heart, it's important to get the right diagnosis, isn't it? You know, if I want to go to a doctor and the doctor tells me, actually, that you're fine, you should do exercise and eat better. But if there is a heart disease that can only be cured by heart transplant, I might just go out for a run and drop dead that evening because of the wrong diagnosis. And the diagnosis that God gives to the world is that we are fallen and we are deserving of God's wrath. Collectively and individually, we deserve God's righteous judgment. Friends, this is why. It is one of the reasons why it's important to tell others about Jesus. Because in Jesus there is salvation. It's important to tell others that they are storing up God's wrath against themselves on the day of the judgment unless they repent and turn to Christ. And be sure to know that on that day, the judgment will be completely fair and just. Because God will judge us, not by some impossible standard, but the, the, the standards that have been revealed to each one of us. Often people ask, well, what about those people who haven't heard the gospel? Isn't it unfair that God will judge them by standards that they don't even know? Well, take a look at verse 12 again. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. You see, God will judge by the fair standard that have been revealed to them in their hearts. The Jewish people and now the Christians know and have the scripture. It means that we'll be judged by the standard of scripture. But if we don't have the scripture, if we have not uh, been revealed, um, gifted in the movies, then they'll be judged, verse 15, by the law written in their hearts. 
in their conscience. They know. You see, what Paul is saying is that some, to some degree, everybody knows the Ten Commandments. You know, in chapter 1, he's told us that everybody should know to worship God. Because God's his presence, His power has been revealed so clearly to the world. And everybody also knows that we shouldn't murder, we shouldn't commit adultery, we shouldn't steal, and lie, and envy others, that these are evil things. Everybody knows the standards, and they'll be judged by those standards. Francis Schaeffer is an apologist, he's got a brilliant illustration. He says, imagine a little reporter like this that hangs around, invisible, and drama reports every moral judgment that you make against other people. That reports everything. This is, he says, how he will judge each of us. When we stand on the dock, God will simply play back the words that we have said against other people. How many times have you told your kids not to lie? And you have lied yourself. He showed us how he'll show us how proud we have been. And he'll show us times when we have condemned other people's pride. He can show us times when we told our friends to let things go and just forgive and move on. But then he'll show us how we have been pride. How we harbor the anger um, in, our, in our hearts. You see, it's our own standards. Standards of, standards of we have used to judge other people. They will condemn us. They will convict us and say that we are sinners in the, uh, in, under God's judgment. And there is no miscarriage of justice here. No chance of that, verse 16. Because all of the secrets are known to God. Friends, on that day, there will be no more lawlessness. On that judgment day, no one will be able to say, I am better than you. When all our sins are laid bare to the world, none of us will say, Wow, you are a great sinner. Because we'll know that we're sinners ourselves. And friends, it doesn't have to be on that day. It can be here today. In the church, as you come in, there should be no moralizers in the church. As people who know how sinful we are. As people who have been convicted by these words and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are sinners of ourselves, there should be no moralizing, looking down on others for their sins. Because we know that we're saved by grace alone. There is no room for judgmentalism in the church. There is no reason to be shocked by other people's sins. Let's assume each week as we come to church that I fail. Let's assume that you have failed. Let's extend God's grace to one another. Because we know who we are and we know God's grace. Tony Campolo is an American pastor and sociologist who tells a story. You might have heard the story. It's a famous story that he's written in a book. Uh, it's a time when he threw a birthday party in Hawaii. It was a conference because of the time difference. He, was, he stayed up late and he was hungry in the middle of the night. He went to visit a diner. And as he was sitting in the diner, he listened to uh, this conversation between these two people. One was a woman named Agnes and her friend. Agnes was saying to her friend that tomorrow was going to be her birthday. Her friend, he writes, responded in a nasty tone. So what do you want me to do? Throw you a birthday party? What do you want? You want me to get your cake and sing happy birthday? And after they left, Tony asked uh, the owner, Harry, who they were. And he found out that Agnes was a prostitute who came to visit the diner every night. And that, at that moment, Tony decided to throw a birthday party for her. And with the help of Harry, the owner, he organized this party. Uh, he put word got out at 3.15 a.m. They came in and it was wall in his words, a filled with prostitutes, and then Tony. And when she walked in at 3.30 um, a.m., everybody cried out, happy birthday, and she completely flabbergasted. He writes, her mouth fell open, her legs seemed to buckle a bit. Her friends grabbed her arms to steady her as she was led to sit on one of the stools along the 
helped her. We all sang Happy Birthday to her. As we came to the end of her singing, happy, with Happy Birthday to your eyes, Happy Birthday to you, her eyes moistened. And then on the birthday day, with all the candles on it, it's carried out. She lost it and she openly cried. And she didn't want to eat the cake because no one had done such a kind thing to her. She wanted this to last a little longer. She asked uh, her friends if she could just take the cake home and keep it for a bit. And they said yes. And so she said, oh, my house is nearby. I'll be right there. She took the cake, went out, and nobody knew what to do. But there was silence that descended into the room. And Tony then said, what do you say? Can we pray for her? And so he did. And he writes, when, he, when I finished, Harry leaned over. Hey, he never told me they were a preacher. What kind of a church do you belong to? In one of those moments, when just the right, right words came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws a birthday party for prostitutes at 3 a.m. in the morning. Harry waited a moment and then almost sneered and answered, No, you don't. There's no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join it. Friends, Christians know the kindness of the Lord. Kindness to us is not a sign of our righteousness. It's kindness, it's a sign of His grace and His mercy towards us. May we, all of us, give the beauty and know the death of our hearts, the sinfulness of our hearts, but also know the greater grace. Kindness and mercy of our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we confess our sins before you. Lord, we confess our heart's tendency to judge others, to think that we are better than others, to look down on others. And Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal to us the death of our sins, that you would help us to be people who know that we are just sinners saved by your amazing grace. And we pray each day as we wake up, we we'll count our blessings and know your kindness and know your mercy. And we pray that you make us a people who extend that kindness and mercy to one another. That tells us, that tell us to the world that amazing kindness and mercy of our Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that your Spirit will help us to tell others about the 